match that with that one. Thank you. Chase, thank you. Okay, come. Cheers. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Nick and I work for Zero Invasive Predators, or ZIP for short. Um, so we're a not-for-profit um, and our focus is on removing rats, possums and stoats from large mainland areas in New Zealand. Um, yeah, and then protecting those areas from reinvasion. <coughs> so this in turn gives our native species a chance to, to regenerate and um, you get back to healthy populations. So eradication in um, these areas, this is a photo of one of our blocks. Um, it's, it's pretty rugged, uh, a lot of bush, a lot of mountains, a lot of steep ravines. Um, so yeah, pretty tricky stuff to work in. So <coughs> what, yeah, what makes this area so beautiful is also um, making it very, very hard to detect and control these invasive species in the landscape. So the challenge, um, eradication of these invasive species from the mainland of New Zealand is a first. Um, it's definitely been done on offshore islands or fenced areas. Um, so current control operations at the moment are suppression based, which means you knock your invasive species populations down to a low level. It gives your native species a chance to semi-regenerate um, before you've got to come back and do that control operation again. So eradication, although more expensive in the short term, um, definitely is cheaper in the long term and then has, has a lot um, greater benefits for our native species. Um, a lot of what we do or ZIP does is research and development. Um, so we're finding out what works, what doesn't, and things that don't we chuck away and then we move on until we've got, um, we narrowed it down to something that works really, really well. Um, amongst our operational work, we're doing a lot of trials. Um, so researching um, what our invasive species are doing, how do they interact with our devices, um, what devices work well, what, what ones uh, don't. Um, and many of our tools or their components um, have multiple iterations. So one of our tools is called a, it's called the Zippin, which is a rat and stoat trap. Um, when the animal goes in, uh, a little door pops down, a CO2 canister goes off and it euthanizes the animal. Um, and then the trap auto reports uh, via satellite to a web server um, to let us know that that trap's gone through many iterations to get it to where it is today. Um, so when it started out, it had two entries into it. Um, we found that it was a bit difficult with the treadle or the set off system, so we made it single entry. Um, then we had issue with the treadle system and the plastics warping from humidity um, in the bush. So then we had to change the plastic for the treadle system. Um, we then discovered that rain on, on the west coast areas, um, heavy amounts of rain would get into the trap and set it off. So we had to design a little rain guard for the door. Um, and then we filmed stoats and rats, rats escaping um, out of the spring-loaded door. Um, within about two minutes, that's what the CO2 canister takes to, to release. Um, so we had to put a little door lock on it as well. So all of these little iterations have to be trialled, recorded, and then changed when you figure out what the best solution is. Um, to help us defend from reinvasion, um, we use geographic features such as rivers, rivers and mountain ranges. Um, so up here, this is on the west coast. Um, Franz Joseph is out to the west there and then we come right up into the Southern Alps. Um, so the Southern Alps are a pretty impassable barrier, um, which helps us. Uh, the, yeah, the area of country that we work in, um, 
the front country we have cell reception, but the back country we don't. It's very rugged, um, heavy bush canopy and steep cliffs, which wreak a bit of havoc with our GPS. So our first large scale block um, was the Whatadoa Perth, which is the one to the very east there. So it's a 12,000 hectare block. Um, we started that in 2019 and we had eight ranges. Next year we'll be actively managing 130,000 hectares um, and about 24 ranges. So our area of work is, is growing um, quite substantially each year. So the requirements um, for our system, uh, when I started was that there wasn't much, there was a single person um, doing a lot of desktop work. So my task was to come in and build something that would suit the team and help us do what we needed to do. So the requirements, um, when we set out, we wanted to have full control of the data. So essentially we needed direct access to the system that was hosting the data. Um, the ability to move it, to query it, etc. Uh, we wanted the ability to fully customise the system to our needs and then be able to change that system um, down the track as we changed. Uh, the system were needed to be um, able to be replicated or duplicated reasonably easily. So as we moved into new project sites, um, we wanted the ability to replicate what we've got and then change slightly for that project. Um, offline capable, uh, yeah, no cell reception in the back country um, and the team could go out for a week or 14 days at a time. Uh, needed to be supporting multi-users, so people in the office viewing and editing data and then people in the field capturing um, that data. Uh, needed to be maintained by a small team, that was me and um, managing the deployment, the servicing, and the properties of the infrastructure in the field. So deployment of all our devices, the traps, bait stations, etc., cetera, um, servicing those, and then for our trials, capturing properties um, based on what we were finding. Um, and as we sort of started out, uh, it had to be quite cost effective. So high level, the stack we went with. Um, we could have gone with any cloud platform, but AWS seemed to have all of the services um, that we needed. Um, it was AWS, uh, I found it reasonably easy to set up. Um, the ability to scale up, scale down, start things, uh, pretty simple, pretty quick. Uh, which was great for me because I had no support on that. Uh, we used um, a Postgres SQL with the PostGIS extension run on the um, Amazon RDS service. Um, so yeah, PostGIS uh, gave us, or Postgres gave us access to the data um, and yeah, a good suite of spatial tools. Uh, we also started up a AWS EC2 instance, and that was where we ran GeoServer um, as our web-facing application. So GeoServer ran um, on Tomcat, and then we had Apache 2 um, as a reverse proxy, so we could enable SSL just to secure the platform. And then our automation software or task management software was Apache Airflow. Um, at the moment, it's actually not on EC2, it's on a local machine in the office, um, but the intention was to get it up there. Um, and then for our mapping software, we used, Q, or we went with QGIS. Um, I came from a background of Esri, but yeah, started using QGIS, um, very powerful. The expression language, the geometry generators made it really flexible. Um, it was fast. Um, not so much on large data sets, but we weren't dealing at national level. Um, uh, yeah, it was free, which was good, and I found it reasonably easy to learn, and so have our field team, except uh, they've, they've picked it up pretty fast. Um, it connected to GeoServer and PostGIS, just like that, no hassle, no issue. Um, and then for our mobile application, 
we went with Qfield Cloud. Um, the reason we went with Qfield Cloud was at the time, so it was about 2019, um, Qfield Cloud was sort of promised in uh, mid-2020, uh, and then COVID hit. Um, so they've only just released Qfield Cloud into beta at the moment, so yeah, two years later. Um, we've been hanging out for that. The database, um, this is kind of just a high level and sort of the core tables that, that make the whole system work. Um, there's more fields which, which I haven't displayed here. Um, but yeah, this is the, the core tables that allow us to record um, what's happening in the field. So the device location table uh, essentially has a device system and that is an attribute which describes what it is in the field. So is it our bait station network? Is it our AI camera network? Um, is it our possum cage trap? So just separating out those points because we can have multiple devices at the same point location. Uh, a project name, um, so that just allows us to separate our points uh, based on the project um, and that's because the site names although unique within a project can be um, duplicated across other projects so the project name allowed us to make those site names unique um, the device system project name and site name they are essentially our foreign keys into our related tables so the first set of the related tables down on the bottom left is our actions table and our actions table allows us to record um, the deployment of infrastructure in the field. So any, uh, uh, sorry, a set of our, for example, a zip in the um, rat and stoat trap can have many con different components. So it can have the, the body, it can have a treadle, it can have a door lock, um, a luring system, um, a node, a sat box, all these different components, and they might not all be deployed at the same time. So each of the components gets a record, and then the action state is what state that thing is in. So we can go out and we, uh, in the database, we set all of these different things to deploy, and we say they all set to, to do. And then once they're installed, um, they get changed to um, installed or then get removed so we can track the components that are installed or needing to be installed. Um, every time a thing gets or changes state that becomes a new record in the database so we can keep track of the history. The events table um, that manages all of our servicing um, is essentially just a thing that happens at a time so it could be a SD card service, it could be a um, a lure service, a bait station service, um, yeah, reasonably simple. And then the properties table is just a key value pair that allows us to capture um, things uh, for our trials. Um, a lot of the time it gets used for bait take. Um, so the field ranger goes out and they'll check a bait station and then they'll record how much bait was taken from that bait station. Uh, and the detections table, um, every trail camera we have that takes an image, that's called a detection, and our AI camera system, when they get set off, um, record uh, an image and a detection. So there's um, detections, are possum detections, or any species that are in the field. Um, it's about five and a half million detection records in that table at the moment, um, although a lot of those are vegetation, so every time a tree branch moves, um, the trail camera sets off and takes a picture of it. So the web server, web server component, um, so we went with GeoServer. Um, it's, a, it's a stable project and has regular development, um, updates and support. Um, and as I was saying before, we run that in Tomcat and then use Apache 2 um, as a reverse proxy. So it gives us a, a production ready and secure platform. Um, we enabled SSL uh, with Apache 2, then we just blocked all other communication that wasn't on HTTPS. 
Uh, the other thing to do with GeoServer, or that was handy for us, is um, moving the GeoServer data directory outside of the Tomcat installation. Um, that way, if you have to refresh your GeoServer or upgrade, um, you don't lose all your settings. Um, within GeoServer, we have um, two connections to our database. We have an editing and a viewing connection. Um, so it just lets us secure that data a little bit um, and restricting on restricting people on what they can see um, and what they can access. Um, and within GeoServer, we only utilize the WFS services. Um, so this just gives the, the users the ability to edit and query the data like a normal feature layer within QGIS, um, allows them to set their own symb symbology and labeling. Uh, the one thing we do do outside of the default for our WFS is set the return limit to 100,000 records. I think the default's about 10,000. Um, to help the team manage what's happening in the field, uh, we set up our data management projects. So each um, block within our larger project area will have one of these maps and it shows all the data they need to manage devices in the field, manage servicing, um, and plan out their stints. So this one, yeah, this map has all the relationships between the tables set up, has all the symbology, all the attribute forms set up, um, and all the themes. So having themes set up allows us, allows the team to quickly switch between a device system and show everything that's needed. Um, so this is a this is the South Okarito block near Franz Josef, um, and showing our AI camera, or artificial intelligent camera locations as the stars, and then the track network throughout that block. Then we also set up a bunch of viewing maps, um, kind of like reports in a way. So it shows the team what's happening. Um, this one here is showing bait take from our bait stations. So green dots mean that the bait station hasn't had any bait taken out of it. The red dots mean that there is a lot of bait. So we can start to see where are our populations of rats um, in that area. When do we need to stop? Or when can we pull out of an area and start removing bait stations? Or where do we need to keep our work up? So most of these are essentially SQL views that just join the multiple tables um, in the database and then present out through GeoServer. The, um, this is a, um, so this, oh, it's a screenshot of our QField app. So on the left, um, this is in the Whātauroa Perth block. Um, this is showing the bait station network. So we've had repeated rat detection in that area. Um, there's some survivorship of rats in the area, but I think a lot, we think a lot, are coming across the river. So every now and then a rat will fall in the river or decide to swim. Um, so then our detection devices pick that up um, and then we go in and, and deploy bait stations to control that. So yeah, on the left, this is what the, the field ranger will see on their phone. Um, then they can click and see all the layers um, and switch between the themes to look at a different device system. Um, that data management map that I showed before is essentially this. It gets exported out um, into a QField project. Um, when they click on a, a point in the map, they then can see information about that point um, and see the related tables and then they've got the ability to enter related records. Um, so on the very end there is an example of ent entering a servicing event. So the top box is a value map um, with a drop down of different things that they can do. The date time field and the user field automatically populate. Um, so that saves the field ranger time. Um, they're just essentially selecting one thing and then they hit okay. Uh, the field capture process, um, so before a stint, the 
team plan and prepare what they need to do. So setting the data up, setting the symbology or the devices that need to be deployed or service, serviced. Then they export that out into an offline project that goes into QField. Um, they go out in the field, they capture the data um, and they might do that up to about a week at a time. Um, come back in, sync the data back in uh, and then the science and research team um, will review that and then help decide what's going to happen the next time they go out again. Um, at our bivvies or bivouacs out in the field, they do have internet access, so satellite internet, so they've got the ability to sync mid-stint if needed, um, but it can be a little bit of a hassle to sync some projects and not all of them. So where to next? Um, QField Cloud, uh, as I was saying before, it's in beta. Uh, the ability to automatically sync stuff from QField would be fantastic for us. Um, at the moment, it's manual. People running the QField sync tool. Um, containerization of our system components. Um, it just make them a bit more portable and deployable. Um, automating more of our model outputs. So we have uh, ecologists and statisticians um, who run quite complex models. Um, so you're trying to automate some of their things that they're doing, um, make it quicker for them. Um, and at the moment, our QField projects are very sort of designed around the deployment of infrastructure, not so much the servicing. So the symbology is all set around what needs to be, to be deployed or what um, is installed, etc. So, making up some Q field projects that are more focused around servicing those deployments. Um, and that is that's me. Uh, if you have any questions. So that's the, the team when they go out and service a bait station. Um, we know how much bait was put in, so it's pallets or blocks, and then they just count what's gone, and then enter that as a value in the properties table. So then it sinks in, and then we yeah, just do a layer off that. It's all QGIS. Um, being a team of one, <laughs> I mean, it would be nice to, um, definitely. You mentioned there are statisticians and analysts, do they use QGIS? Or? Uh, yep, yep, they use QGIS. Um, our statistician use, uses a lot of R. Um, yeah. Sorry, can you elaborate more on that, if you can, uh, about this um, AI? So, The AI camera is a thermal infrared camera. It looks directly at the ground, um, has some IR sensors, so when an animal approaches, the camera and the unit turns on. Um, animal walks under, so we have a, a mayonnaise lure underneath the camera. The animal walks in, the camera turns on, picks up the heat signature. There's a AI um, unit built in, and the model for the AI is also built in. Um, it detects what it is and then sends that out through our satellite system um, to a web server. So it's, it's kind of revolutionized the detection to the field rangers can be out the next day deploying devices, whereas before with our trail cameras that can be anywhere up to six weeks or two months before you've got them to start responding to that detection. Thank you, Victor. This is a really interesting topic. Um, I had some questions as well, but I think we ran out of time for um, for this lot. But um, yeah, if there's any more questions for this.